Welcome to, you. to the Commune Podcast. Good to be with you. My pleasure. Yeah. Where does the world find you today? I'm in New York City, uh, one of my favorite places on Earth. Good. This big, big, big planet. Yeah, indeed. Well, I am, uh, I'm so excited to, uh, to jump in and explore and discuss your new docuseries, uh, Unknown Amazon, which I've had the pleasure to watch a few episodes. And um, yeah, it's just a fascinating project, which explores, I suppose, the threats confronting the Amazon rainforest, but also the rays of hope. Uh, mm -hmm. And also how complicated and nuanced the situation is, particularly kind of among the people that live in and around the Amazon. Um, but before we, we dive in, I, I was hoping that you could scaffold our conversation a bit in a little biographical information that can help us understand the inspiration behind this project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was born and raised in Rio. Uh, in a lower middle class family. And I always dreamed of traveling. I remember my grandmother, who was a huge inspiration for me. She was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was a flight attendant, a pilot, an astronaut, a truck driver, anything that got me places and that introduced me to different cultures. And the Amazon always felt fascinating and mysterious. And I think I'm not alone. I think over the centuries, you know, uh, scientists and explorers and missionaries, everyone has uh, been mesmerized by this uh, this place, the largest rainforest on earth, that in a way uh, was a really dangerous place, but was a really uh, unique and rich place. So that was always in the back of my mind. Um, I went to journalism school. I moved to New York 20 years ago. Uh, today, I host the most watched travel show in South America that took me to 65 countries. And it took me all that journey to finally go back to the Amazon, which if you look at the map, it's somewhat close to where I was born. But now, after I've been there, after I spent almost six months there with uh large variety of different people and immersed in different communities, I see that the Amazon is far from, I mean, it's so singular, so unique, so authentic mm -hmm. in a world, in a globalized world in which I feel like places tend to start looking the same, feeling the same, smelling the same, you know, the Amazon still, still feels far. And that is incredible and this project really is the definition of a dream come true for someone like me as uncomfortable and dangerous and risky as it was you know no toilet for weeks no showers no i mean that's just the beginning of it the top tip of the iceberg but it was so fulfilling and so eye-opening it was amazing Mm, yeah, and, and you really do bear your soul in it. Uh, you make yourself quite vulnerable. Um, and, and some of it is just self-deprecating humor, and, and other it, of it is on the precipice of danger. Um, and, uh, and of course, I don't want to uh, ruin any viewing that, that people will have over, um, you know, after it is released, but I'm sure we can uh, yeah. get into it a little bit. And, and just for full disclosure, I, sp I lived in Brazil, in Rio, for three years as a, wow. as a kid. I lived in Jacarepaguá. I don't know if you know yeah, where that is. That course. was in yeah. 1974. That was a, a little edgy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I went to the American school in, in, uh, in Gavia or in Jardim Gavia, Botanico. which is think, where yeah. my mom lives today. Okay, yeah. And we took one trip to Manaus. And mm -hmm. um, there's a family photo that's become um uh, sort of a legendary or an heirloom in our family of me sitting uh, on the wheel of a boat driving a ferry down the amazon um so i have a personal connection with it of course it's it's uh 45 years ago but um but when i when i saw this project come to light it obviously struck a, a personal chord in me so um yeah the 70s were you know, a game changer for the Amazon. Like that's when the destruction really 
began, like that's when it all started. Uh, the government really seeing the Amazon as basically a way to profit from all that land. They were like, other countries have already dis destroyed their own uh, forests. Now it's our turn. We have the largest uh, rainforest on earth. Uh, if the Amazon was a country, it would be the sixth largest country on earth. And so they decided to start really exploring. And uh, that's when the illegal mining started. That's when the petroleum started coming out of the Amazon. Um, but when I was born in 1979, 1% of the Amazon, as we know, had been destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, 21, 22% yeah. has been destroyed. Yeah. That's less than a generation. You know, that's really not a lot of time. And scientists pr have proved that if we reach 40%, it's a point of no return. Yeah. It's over. Uh, and that will have, you know, that will be extremely impactful, not just for Brazil, not just for South America, but for the whole world. Yeah, I think that that's what makes this part of the world so potent because it obviously has direct implications on the local economies and local peoples, um, but obviously global implications uh, around climate. And um, mm -hmm. but so, but before dissecting, you know, some of these ex existential issues, which you, um, you know, which you mine in the show from deforestation and mining, cattle farming, um, I wonder if you could hover a bit on the actual geography of the Amazon, because I, I think there is actually some confusion about it. And I even lived in Brazil and in preparation for, for speaking with you, I had to actually dive back in and, and to really understand it because the Amazon is, is somewhat of a broad term that can mm -hmm. refer to the rainforest, but it also can refer to the river. It's generally associated with Brazil in people's minds, but mm -hmm. much of the forest and the river ex or not much. Different countries. Yeah, it's a bunch of different countries. Um, so maybe you could describe the breadth Absolutely. and the scale. Yeah it's, yeah, it's hard to grasp uh, the scale of the Amazon. Um, if, like I said, if it was a country, it would be the sixth largest country in the world. It's large and larger than Western Europe. Uh, one third of all trees on earth are in the Amazon. 20% of all flowing fresh water in the world is in the Amazon. Um, it reaches nine countries. 63% uh, of the Amazon is in Brazil. Um, but ironically, Brazil is not the most biodiverse part of the Amazon, mm. hence why we also went to Ecuador and the border of Peru as well, just to uh, show this other side of the Amazon that, you know, connects to the Andes and it has um, just actually one the, the Amazon in Ecuador is one of the most biodiverse places on earth. Yeah. So you have giant eagles and you have the only bears that can be found in South America. Um, it's just mesmerizing. And like there are parts of this one episode in which you see that I'm in the bamboo forest that literally could be in the mountains in China. I'm like <laughs> walking through grass and you could be in Switzerland. And you're like, this is the Amazon? Who knew? Um, but, you know, maybe because so much of it is in Brazil, um, it's easy to associate, you know, the Amazon basin just to to my country. Uh, but it's massive and it doesn't offer easy answers. Uh, after traveling, like I said, to 65 countries, I, I've been to long fly flights. I've waited hours and hours in airports and I've traveled through the desert. But the Amazon is a different ball game. It's not for the faint of heart. Like when you say, where is our next shoot? It's not like 18 hours from now. It's like two days on a boat on a hammock because they don't have beds yeah. with hundreds of people then nine hours with the equipment upstream in a wooden canoe smaller than my desk you know and then we take a plane but there is no airport there is no landing strip it's crazy yeah. so at, like i said as uncomfortable as it was at certain times um and dangerous as it was i mean the river in the amazon 
it looks beautiful, but it, it's so dangerous, yeah. so dangerous. You know, caimans, piranhas, the current itself will swallow you, stingrays. Um, I mean, there is this little fish called kanjiru hmm. that is basically swims up your geni genitalia, men and women, and stays there and basically kills you from inside. Meanwhile, I'm having, you know, I'm showering, I'm taking a bath with all the indigenous people in that river. And I'm like, dear Lord, protect me because you, you can't defend yourself from that, you know, but um, that's part of what makes this experience so fascinating. And that's part of what makes this show so different, because I feel like Vice is that network that tells stories that other networks won't tell, goes places where other networks won't go, talk to people that other networks won't talk to. Mm. And that has a cost, mainly in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, but you'll see the result. It, it was well worth it. Yeah, I noticed that, uh, I assume the, the show um, was shot during kind of the heart of the pandemic. Um, and, and I'm sure that caused its own challenges as you were already navigating quite a few challenges um, as, it, as it was. Uh, but, you know, I was just reading some statistics about the scale of the biodiversity in the forest, and it's just absolutely staggering. Um, and then also, um, uh, you know, startling how much di biodiversity we're losing, how many species. Um, and so quickly. And, yeah, yeah. And, and so quickly. Now, I wonder if you could talk a little bit also about um, the, I think they're called the Hiberinos, right? Um, yes. the people who the river people. Yeah. And just, um, cause this, of course, once we sort of get into some of the, the tug of war and the challenges that are happening there, um, you know, this is a main focus because it's their local economies and their local traditions mm -hmm. that are in some ways under assault, but in, that are having to be balanced with kind of global growth and et cetera. So maybe you talk a little bit about yeah, uh, your interactions with them and how, how, met, how big is that population at this juncture? Yeah, uh, it, it, I love that you're asking this because this show is divided by communities. Mm -hmm. That was the best tool we had in terms of storytelling to give an accurate view, you know, show a real slice of what the Amazon is like. I mean, from the beginning, when I started pitching the show, um, and I knew it was a crazy idea when Vice said, you want to do this during a pandemic? <laughs> uh, I said, yes. I said, well, I just feel like we're used to reading about the political turmoil in Brazil, wildfires in Brazil, wildlife trafficking in the Amazon, but we had no idea who were these people yeah. who lived actually in the Amazon. Even myself, I mean, I, as a Brazilian, I didn't know. You know, I read books, I watched documentaries, but I still didn't quite understand the, the diversity that we were talking about. I mean, over 350 ethnicities, over 180 uh, idioms, languages. Oh. I mean, it, it, there's a lot at stake. So the first episode is about the Hiberinos, which are these communities that depend on the river. Um, what we tried to do is when we divided these, when we found these communities, we saw also an opportunity to talk about issues that uh, are present in our daily lives, our daily lives, mine in New York, uh, someone in Paris. What I'm trying to say is, uh, for example, in one of my favorite episodes, we talk about the Quilombolas, the slave descendants. Um, we can get into that in a little bit. But in that episode, we found an opportunity to talk about uh, reparations, slavery, racism. And with the Hiberinos, uh, we found an opportunity to talk about climate change and global warming very uh, in a more focused way. The reason uh, being because, I don't know, in like two decades ago, a decade ago, um, these people had to move their communities inland every six to seven years. Now they have to move every six months. Yeah. So every six months they pack up their homes, their schools, their medical facility, whatever they have, and they have to move inland because the river is rising so quickly. 
and that isolates them more and that makes it harder for them to uh, be able to hunt, survive, fish. It's huge. Yeah, and, or and develop any infrastructure. Yeah, develop any yeah. infrastructure for schooling yeah. or anything. Yeah, I think I, I, I don't know if it. I can't remember if it made the cut, but in one of the first cuts we showed there was a school, uh, like by the river, and there there actually there was there was not a school. It was just a river. They're like a year ago, our school was here. It was swallowed by the river after a thunderstorm. You know, so that's the reality of these people. However, uh, I'm really proud of how we've been able to tackle really tough uh, situations, speak, talk about difficult topics. Uh, there are lots of tears, but I think the show brings a lightness that I think is refreshing. You know, I dance with these people. I laugh with these people. I bond with these people, sometimes with people that I like that I can't rely on language, you know, indigenous people that don't speak Spanish, Portuguese, English, anything. Uh, they speak their own Munduruku language, for example, and exercising that, you know, connection on a human level was allowed me to really flex some emotional muscles, you know, connect with people in a way that I had never had before. And I've been to Myanmar, I've been to the border of North Korea, to Spahan, but that was a really, um, a huge lesson. It was really like challenging, but rewarding for me. Yeah. I mean, you really do humanize yourself. I know that there's a one episode when you travel to Ecuador and I, I believe you're uh, visiting a ca cacao farm or plantation yeah. and you have to eat a worm. I, I don't even know how to describe it exactly. And I'm like, is he really going to do it? <laughs> and then well, the worm is alive yeah. and it bites you. If you don't eat it quick enough, it'll bite your tongue. Yeah. But I think that, you know, really humanizing yourself to other people as you've met them through this journey um, really allowed for your, a lot of trust, honestly, to be built. And there's so many kind of beautiful moments, um, you know, between you and the Hibarino culture and other cultures there um, that, you know, you really get, uh, you know, led into the house kind of metaphorically. Mm -hmm. um, and that really is accretive to, to the show. Um, and, you know, maybe we could ground some of the threats facing the Amazon in a couple of examples, because obviously we hear a lot about deforestation. Uh, we hear about mining, uh, intensive farming with cattle and soy. And there's a actually fascinating segment on palm oil, which I didn't really know yes. about uh, logging energy uh, exploration. But I think there is, um, you know, one of the complicated and nuanced elements which you know you brilliantly explore is you know how some of these indigenous communities are split a and mm -hmm. you know there is this desire to preserve local traditions and local economies but then there is also this pressure um, that that many of these communities are feeling to get in on on some of the action <laughs> from yeah. a yeah. from a wealth perspective and there's one particularly hard hitting um, episode with uh, I'll probably mispronounce it but I think it's the Munduruku Munduruku yeah Munduruku, Munduruku. Uh, tribe which means the head choppers <laughs> <laughs> yeah a phenomenon that you that you came too close to knowing um, yeah. So maybe you could use that example to uh, illustrate how yeah. complicated and nuanced the, the situation there is on the ground. Yeah, I think when we talk about indigenous people, and I, I don't mean that just in the Amazon, I think there's a misconception. We have a tendency to find a stereotype and sort of imagine how they are. But when you talk about millions of indigenous people, like when you talk about 350 ethnicities, some of them are more urbanized. Some of them don't wear clothes. Some of them has ne have never seen a plane in their lives. Some are just getting introduced to the Internet. And I hear a lot of um, mainly from far right 
you know, Bolsonaro, who's the president of Brazil supporters, who's not a fan of indigenous people at all. Uh, they basically say, how can you call yourself an indigenous person if you wear shoes? You know, you don't deserve to have indigenous rights if you have a cell phone, you know, like missing out on the fact that they didn't choose this. We weren't invited, you know, like uh, I think um, regardless of their opinion, if they want to explore their land or not, um, I try to walk into every single one of those communities with respect. You know, I grew up in a household uh, in which my parents said, you can be mad at me, you can think you hate me, you can be disappointed at me, but you're going to respect me. And respect is sort of like walking and sort of finding the humanity and being willing to to listen to what they have to say. I didn't want the show to be about me. And this isn't a travel show in a sense of come here. Actually, quite the opposite. A lot of places I don't think you're going to want to go after yeah, watching the show. Probably. But this was an opportunity to highlight and to pay homage to these people that so generously opened their doors and opened their hearts and told me how they felt. Um, on this episode specifically, I meet this woman called Alessandra Munduruku that has become a really prominent activist uh, for indigenous rights um, around the world, actually. She lives a really tough life because she knows uh, what she wants, and that's protection for her people. She's well aware that if women, because the, the the indigenous rights in Brazil is very much led by females, which is something that is new to indigenous communities in Brazil. And she's sort of like the spokesperson. But she has two kids. She has to change her phone number every month. She runs away from politicians. She runs away from farmers. People want to, you know, shut her up. And she was kind enough to spend time with me. And she kept saying, you know, I would much rather not need to be here. I'd rather, you know, like the forest for us provides us with everything that you guys think you have, but you actually don't. The forest is our grocery store. The forest is our hospital. The forest is our bank. You know, it was like a sustainable environment in which if you need something, if you're hungry, you hunt, you know, if you need to bathe, you go in the river and all of this is being, has been taken away from us. Like she's very aware of history, even though she hasn't gone to school, but she says throughout the centuries, we've been destroyed. We've been ignored. We haven't been taken into consideration. So she's very, very eloquently. And as you'll, you'll see on the show, everyone will see on the show emotionally, you know, voices, her desperation and how she feels about this moment, about what's at stake. So after talking to her, I heard that people from the Munduruku ethnicity were blocking the busiest road in the Amazon. Kilometers and kilometers of trucks that had produce to export to America, to China, to India. So for two days, they've been blocking the road. As any journalist would do, I told my crew, we got to go talk to them. Like, that's really puzzling and confusing. Why did I just spend so much time with this woman who gave me all this information that made me believe this one side of the story? Why are these people from that same ethnicity asking for the opposite? What basically what they were protesting is they wanted to explore indigenous land. Uh, they claim that, you know, big brands uh, from around the world come into the Amazon, profit, extract everything they can, petroleum, uh, logging, Gold. mining, yeah. and then become rich and they end up poor without land or money. So they wanted to start exploring indigenous land. So I got there in a matter of 15 minutes. What am I talking about? 15 seconds, <laughs> we were surrounded by 250 armed indigenous people. Um, and I understand, like most of them did not, 95% of them did not speak Portuguese, Spanish, English, anything. They spoke Munduruku, but there were a couple that spoke Spanish. And I was able to communicate with them and try to show them that I wasn't there under any, like, a bias purpose, agenda. I just wanted them to tell me their side of the story. Uh, 
they are so scarred, rightfully so, and they're so hurt, and they don't have time for BS. Hmm. And quite honestly, they didn't believe, I think, half of what I said, but I basically said, I respect your history. I understand why you're desperate, but I'm here to give you a chance to tell me your side of the story. I ended up being death sworn after an hour and a half of negotiating me and three people from my crew, one armed guard versus 250 of them. There's something really um, scarring now from my point of view, when you like when you have an indigenous person who's a bow and an arrow to your forehead. Yeah. It's like I've interviewed people with guns. I've been to Mexican cartels. I've been to people that are considered terrorists. Uh, but there's something so pheromonic and so animalistic about that. You know, you see in their eyes that they see you almost as they see a prey, as if they're hunting. And they wouldn't think twice before, you know, killing you right at the spot. So keeping calm and serene under those circumstances <laughs> was really, really tough. Being death sworn is they put ink on your face. And basically what they're saying is, you're lucky enough to get out of here. But if any Munduruku sees you, they'll chop your head off. And that's when we had to be evacuated from uh, Itaituba, the city where we were. Uh, so once again, um, it's as you were saying, there are no easy answers and it's super complex. It's easy for me to come here, go, come back home to my apartment in New York and say, those, you know, I don't want to cuss in your <laughs> podcast. But <laughs> That's okay. You won't be the first. Those one. MFs, uh, <laughs> they did that to me and victimized myself. But I genuinely understand where they were coming from. I'm grateful that I was able to survive and leave. But I also am proud to have given them a voice. And I hope that's yeah. clear on the show. Yeah. I mean, I think you did a really gallant and graceful job of being humble and, and hearing and listening. Uh, because at the core of so much unrest right now is just the need to be heard. Mm -hmm. People just want to be heard. And, uh, and they feel like the media that's coming at them um, is, yes. is full of misaligned incentives and in many times fake. And that was actually one of the more uh, interesting components about that, that even in a relatively remote part of the Amazon that this notion of fake news has yes. become uh, uh, so prominent. And, you know, I, I will say just that that whole section of, of the show was some of the most visceral and poignant footage I have, uh, I've seen in a, in a long time and required a, Thank a, you. a they good destroyed yeah. our equipment as you <laughs> saw. Yeah. So for the editing, that was really tough. Um, but I'm because of my travel show that airs in South America, uh, I'm a known face right. down there. Yeah. And when you mentioned fake news, uh, they immediately looked at me and not because I've had any sort of controversy, not that my credibility, I mean, it, it, I'm proud to say it's intact. Um, but they associated me. Someone said he works on television. Someone right. recognized me even in the middle of the forest and that I felt like, you know, when you watch movies and you see, I don't know, like when they throw the gladiators to the lions and everyone's like, yeah, there was a moment in there that I was like, uh, getting out of here. my yeah. mom is not, I, I, I wish my mom, I hope she doesn't watch that part because I know it's going to kill her. But, yeah. you know, of course, I underplayed. I'm like, no, it was fine. It was okay. Yeah. She's okay. like, Pedro, I told you to be a priest. Why did you go into media? <laughs> um, yeah, well, it, I think that that, uh, you so said we're getting at something interesting here because I, I think that segment and what we're talking about is emblematic of, of a larger uh, global tug of war, if you will, mm -hmm. where... Yeah that media is seen as associated with elite or elitism and mm -hmm. globalism and mechanization and neoliberalism and, you know, all of these kind of trends of, of modernity that and income inequality that have left a lot of people behind. And that there, I mean, you can also see this 
playing out kind of in India with the farmers protest, um, which is really pitting, uh, yeah, this kind of globalism against the maintenance of local economies and traditions and conservation of land. And so I, I almost felt like this kind of global debate was coming to a, a, a pinhead <laughs> right there. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, that, that's an amazing compliment to me, because like I said, I, I really think two things will uh, make people connect with the show. And one is sort of like humanizing uh, headlines. And I think people will connect with and fall in love with these characters. Mm -hmm. But I think they will understand that the Amazon is the connective tissue of the show, the essence of the show. However, the show is an opportunity to talk about things that affect us directly on a daily basis. Uh, so it's easy to talk about the Amazon and just think that the Amazon is as close to our home as Mars. But it's not. They're dealing with stuff that we're dealing to. You know? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the global implications of what's happening in the Amazon. Um, you know, for me, my, my general understanding around the, the biggest risk around deforestation has been involved in the, um, in the carbon capture or the carbon mm -hmm. stores that, um, that the, the role that, that the Amazon plays in being able to sequester carbon yeah. um, and obviously mitigate um, global warming. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, that is under attack from sort of myriad different angles. I remember, I think it was in 2019, the fires in the Amazon, mm -hmm. um, which uh, you know were just absolutely intense and widespread. And of course, you know, the trees themselves are carbon storage um, yeah. vehicles. So the these mass fires are obviously uh, releasing a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, contributing to rising temperatures. They're also just de kind of depleting the, the canopy that exists over the Amazon, which then um, contributes to soil degradation and, and all of this, yeah. um, all of the concomitant impacts there. So I wonder if you could talk about, you know, what are some of the key threats that you uncovered from around, particularly as it pertains to, to deforestation? Yes, of course. I mean, it, I don't pretend to be a scientist, but the numbers are so shocking that I think even people that don't understand science at all can't help but understanding how dire the situation is, you know, uh, one third of the trees around the world are in the Amazon. Uh, you can only imagine what the impact would be if all of a sudden that became a huge savanna, you know, um, and it's not just, uh, environmentally speaking. I mean, uh, mining, logging, the cattle industry is a huge problem. Less than 10 million people live in that huge space, which is the Amazon basin, more than 60 million head of cattle. Mm -hmm. uh, so cattle ranching has become uh, an excuse for land grabbing. So basically people that don't own the land, they just kill all the trees, clear that land, toss some cattle in there. And then a few years later, own that land and sell it for a lot of money. So uh, soy farming, for example, the more China uh, needs soy, which is our number one buyer, the more f forest has to be destroyed. Um, when it comes to science and medicine, like it's been proven that less than 1% of the Amazon has been explored for medical purposes. So there are all these cures for illnesses that are probably in the Amazon that we might not even discover, ever know at all. Um, and we also have a responsibility. It's really easy to just blame bad leaders. I mean, first of all, bad leaders for the most part were put in place because of us. Uh, but I'm saying on an everyday basis, like 70% uh, of all the products that you can find in a grocery store have palm oil in them. Mm -hmm. Everything from uh, your lipstick, your ice cream, your pizza, your chocolate. There is a way of being 
uh, more aware of where those ingredients are coming from. Oh, I said 70% have palm oil. So like the palm oil industry has destroyed countries, entire forests in Asia, and now it's starting to destroy the Amazon. There is a way of doing sustainable palm oil, uh, palm farming. And I think when we buy our stuff, at home and urban areas, we should try to be more aware. It's become such a cliche and I, and I hate sounding professoral or preaching or being like, do this or do that. You're part of the problem. You know, I think people have a hard time connecting with the problem when they're just, I'm just pointing my finger at what everyone else should do. Uh, I think the one lesson is either we do something about it now, whether it's uh, voting a certain way, whether it's supporting a certain cause, whether it's uh, being a part of a movement or just, you know, buying products in, in a more conscious manner. Or, I mean, your kids, your grandchildren probably will have a really tough time. It's easy to be selfish and be like, this is not affecting me right now. But I think we can be and should be better than that. Yeah. And there's one thing to fulfill our basic human needs. It's another thing to consume or overconsume gold jewelry, for example. Yes. Like you, um, I think you believe you went to Ecuador to visit um, yes. a One gold. One of the oldest mining facilities in the Amazon. Yeah, and it was startling. I think there was, in Ecuador, there's $270 million, I believe, worth of gold exported every year. Uh, mm -hmm. the overwhelming majority to the United States um, for the manufacturing and, and distribution and sale of jewelry. Yes. Um, and I think you know, we have to take an honest look at ourselves in the mirror. And, and, and are those consumptive behaviors really serving humanity when the byproduct of that is mercury flowing into the water table? Um, polluting the rivers and, of course, degrading the quality of fish, actually even poisoning the fish, which is um, a primary source of sustenance for the people yeah. living on the banks of the river. Of course, mining also employs a lot of people I mm -hmm. in Ecuador. So, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about that experience because it, yeah, that, it's also... That, I've, yeah. always been, I've always been fascinated by uh, mining in general because it's such a foreign world and i'm claustrophobic so the idea of getting into those you know tiny little holes and then uh lighting dynamite as you saw we did um it, it was just uh almost an outer body experience being there in that fog but even though you know we need mining still because our smartphones have gold whether you like it or not. Yeah. Um, but I agree with you. There are practices that are avoidable, like, for example, buying gold and jewelry, mainly um, not even trying to find out where they come from, if there was slave labor, etc. But uh, the mercury issue is a huge problem because six out of 10 Munduruku, for example, to use the example of the ethnicity we talked about, six out of 10 of them have high levels of mercury in their system, in their body. And so their life expectancy is really short because they start having health problems really, really early on. That's something that they never had before. You know, there are types of cancer that like history shows that didn't exist uh, in those indigenous communities. And now a lot of people, huge percentage dies from cancer. So yeah, it's a convoluted issue, and I try to make it as um, accurate, journalistically uh, precise as I can, but also easy to digest. You yeah. know, how does that huge equation that may seem so difficult to grasp impact those people? What can we do? If it goes wrong, how is it going to impact us? You know, so once again, it's sort of like finding... Uh, the humanity behind this situation. Uh, I was shocked but mesmerized by how welcoming they were to me. You know, like they allowed me to go in there, set the dynamite, like make the holes in the rock, try to find gold. 
and actually put my head inside these machines that are extremely dangerous because you're basically inhaling that mercury. Uh, but spending like a day in the life, you know, in the shoes of a miner or an illegal miner in the Amazon is something I'll never forget. You know, I, I think I'll have some unique stories to tell my kids. <laughs> yeah, as someone who also suffers from claustrophobia and actually I just I wrote a long article about the nature of the neurobiology of fear relating to various phobias so I'll send it to you um, Please. and also like yeah. the lie the way they live all of these people like some of the most isolated communities on earth like the way they live in this one of the oldest mining facilities uh, in the Amazon. It's like this shanty town and it's a microcosm of the rest of the planet. Like you see uh, the questions they ask, the things they're not happy about, uh, what they care for. You're like, this is so far from my reality. But I was able to find common ground and relate to them in a really unexpected way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's on full display. You know, one of the other elements that I really enjoyed about the show was it, it wasn't just an endless exposition of doom and gloom. Yeah. <laughs> um, you did really um, prod at uh, and discover some optimism and some rays of yeah. hope. And, um, you know, particularly I was drawn to the cacao farm. And I think there was yeah. one guy, Santiago, um, yes. who... Um, has built uh, a Pakari chocolate um, exactly. by really animating and motivating the local community. So I wonder if you could talk about that particular interaction and how that might serve as a model uh, mm -hmm. for other communities in and around the Amazon and to be honest, globally. Well, that was really inspiring because it would have been really easy, you know, for Santiago, the owner of this chocolate brand, to find these amazing cacao farms in the middle of the Amazon and just bring his own people, you know, and just make a ton of money. Um, and the people that lived there before get nothing. Instead, he actually took the time and it, took a lot of investment to educate an entire com community of Quichuas, which are Amazonians in Ecuador, uh, and actually taught them how to take care of those cacao trees, how to roast those seeds. And now they're considered the best chocolate in the world. It's, it's completely artisanal. Um, I had never like followed each step of the of chocolate making i am addicted to chocolate i <laughs> love it so much yeah and um i actually fell in love with the different stages of what we know as chocolate you know from the fruit uh the difference between yellow cacao and red cacao the smell when the the seeds are being roasted uh to actually be hands-on and do it myself and actually uh Towards the end of the day, I made friends and I also was trying this chocolate that we made. Um, mm. But I think the lesson behind that whole segment, which was such a delicious, no pun intended, such a fun segment to film, uh, is that we need to be aware that empowering local communities is very, very important. Yes. You know, people uh, for years have looked at the human beings that live in the Amazon, almost as they see animals, you know, and those people need to survive as well. Either we leave them alone and they keep living like their ancestors have lived for centuries, or if we're going to go in there and we're going to profit from that land, we need to use them. We need to pay them. We need to teach them. That's we right. need to engage them. Uh, and I think that is, uh, as you said, an example, not just for, you know, communities in the Amazon, but isolated communities around the world. Uh, this problem of income inequality, uh, it's a snowball. It's a domino effect. You go into uh, regions in Africa or Asia and you just profit from it. 
and you leave those people behind and then you wonder why you know you see violence and you see despair right. in these places well you're in part to blame for you know yeah yeah absolutely um uh, yeah and i wondered of course if uh your love of chocolate influenced any editorial decisions in the show <laughs> but it's funny well, I, that I pitched that story <laughs> i bet but it's funny that you um that you really gravitated towards the process of it because as i went through um i didn't actually have a very clear idea of how chocolate was made and i actually mm -hmm. bullet pointed it because it was really illustrative from the harvesting to fermenting drying toasting peeling, ground, grinding, mixing with the butter over the fire. It was actually fascinating just to see how, yeah. how it came together. Well, there, there's a lot of greed, too, when you talk about, you know, profiting from a place like the Amazon. I remember asking the owner of this brand, this chocolate brand and owner of these farms. I was like, so now you have the number one chocolate in the world. And let's say tomorrow... Uh, China or India or America falls in love with your chocolate. You make this much, all of a sudden you need to triple, quadruple, quadruple the uh, the production. And he said, no, uh, we will, he said, we might raise the price, but this is as far as we're willing to go. It's funny happy. that you bring that scene up because for me, that scene crystallized the solution to the entire problem that you presented in the show. And mm -hmm. I remember it very, very well. You held up like a cup of tea yes. <laughs> to illustrate like, now you've got to make this much chocolate. Now, what if you've got to make this much? And I think you held a pitcher on top of yes. it. And he looked at you and he said, big doesn't mean better. Wow, you really watched it. <laughs> well, I- I have goosebumps, thank you for yeah, remembering. No, but this, that was, it just absolutely hit home with me because I think that, that that's the bumper sticker for solving a lot of our global issues is that we have been absolutely, you know, hypnotized by notions of growth and consolidation and extraction. And, but what actually makes life worthwhile? You know, in, in some ways we've, we've lost sight of that. And when I watched that particular episode and saw how animated that local community was, how proud of the yes. work, how connected to the product. I mean, here, even in the United States, most farmers never eat the food they grow. Yeah. In fact, it almost never happens uh, yes. because a lot of it you can't even eat. You can't eat. You can't go and pick a stock. Uh, an ear of GMO corn <laughs> in the United States uh, and, and just eat it. And, um, and yeah, that notion that big doesn't always mean better. And if there are, are ways that we can um, animate local communities to, uh, to, to produce product and to raise their standard of living, but to do it in a way that is both you know, healthy for the environment, healthy for mm -hmm. the people around them, yeah. then that has got to be a compelling model. And, and you know, thank you for amplifying it. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. So what are your hopes and dreams for this documentary series? Um, because so, so many of these issues need to be explained and people need to understand them and be educated and, and you do a great job with that. But I, I wonder, you know, if you had a mission statement for it, what would it be? Yeah. Um, from the beginning, I knew no matter what I found in the Amazon, I wanted it to be truthful. I wanted it to be honest. I wanted it to be visceral and organic, but I wanted to find hope. Mm. I did not want to leave that place that meant so much to me, that means so much to me, hopeless. Uh, so I think that was a mission of mine. And I actually feel like I found that in, in a couple of situations, but I think the biggest phenomenon is uh, in the younger generation and the new generation. There is a huge generational gap when we talk about the need to save the planet. Mm -hmm. And I try to shy away from cliches, but it's true. Like you see 
the young people in these communities are the ones that you know are adopting uh, the wildlife in a certain town and they're protecting. They're going to school and they're becoming biologists. They are starting global movements to fight uh, the waste of plastic. They are optimistic about the future. Um, it's not, you know, a mistake. It's not, it didn't, Greta Thunberg didn't just happen. You know, people relate to her message, like young people relate to her message. Um, and so that's, I feel like one of the takeaways that I would like for people to, uh, I don't know, to, to observe in these six episodes, uh, that there is hope. And a lot of this hope is in the hands of people that will have to live with the consequences if this place is destroyed. Uh, the other thing is they, no matter how different we are, we really are similar. Uh, this is a paradox, and it, if it's taken out of context, it might mean nothing. But that's something that the moment I started caring for those people on a human level, the moment I understood what their fears were, their pain was, their traumas were, um, and the moment I connected with them in, like, with our humor, with, yeah. in, like, in a, like, our lightness, when we ate together, when we danced together, when we laughed together, that sort of like, they be, in a way became a family to me. All of a sudden I cared and, and, and I wanted to do something. Like it, it affected me to think of their destruction. And when we talk about destruction, I'm not just talking about physical destruction. You're, you're destroying a, a culture, a tradition that you can't get back. Yeah. You're destroying a language or like wisdom. There's so much that uh, we have to lose by not caring for for the Amazon. And I don't think that's a quote unquote privilege of the Amazon. I think I could uh, do unknown North Africa, unknown Southeast Asia, unknown islands. I mean, I, I can only dream to actually uh, dive into these realities one day. But I think the Amazon was a really special starting point. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think are some of the other industries that can really play an essential role in preserving environment, but also um, raising standards of living? Like, you know, I think about ecotourism, but are are, yes. are, are there other ones? And, and, and maybe speak to ecotourism. Yeah. I mean... What well, are these? Yeah. Like, tourism has evolved tremendously. You know, uh, the idea of you know the like hordes of tourists following a flag with selfie sticks climbing a temple <laughs> in Cambodia or like waiting four hours in line at Disney World. And I'm not judging in any way, shape, or form, but it used to be a reference and it used to be really attractive to everyone. I think uh, maybe because of hosts like Bourdain, for example, and maybe because of uh, writers and journalists, like people I feel like nowadays seek a more culture-based uh, sort of tourism. And whenever there is a natural disaster, you see, you know, even like rescue tourism is a thing now. They, they want to go there and rebuild uh, these towns that were destroyed. There is an empathy, there is a solidarity that's attached to tourism that I don't remember seeing when I was younger. Uh, ecotourism is no different. Like I visited, there is a wildlife episode uh, where I go to the largest rehabilitation center in the uh, Equatorian Amazon. Um, I help rescue this monkey that I they named him little Pedro and they, <laughs> they sent me updates all the time. And we go to this, to visit these bears that are some of the smartest bears on earth, the only ones in Latin America and their goals is we want people to want to come here and see them from afar. And there is an art to sort of play God. I bring it up to the, this guy who owns this land where the bears are running wild. And I'm like, you do everything you can. You dedicate your life to 
the well-being of these bears with nothing in return. You know, like they don't know who you are. You actually you change their environment in a way that they think that no one was ever there before. Uh, and not comparing indigenous communities to animals in any way, shape, or form. But that's kind of what uh, these organizations that you know want to save these indigenous communities, they do. You can't fly over here. You can't have an antenna over there. You can't have a machine making noise over there because they want to, in a way, preserve that environment in such a way that they don't even know we exist. And that's a really altruistic, that's a really generous way of preserving uh, communities, preserving the environment. It's sort of like you don't need that payback. The payback is to know that they're okay. Yeah. Well, I suppose true love or true compassion is always something given and and not something taken. I look at even in my own personal relationships, I can identify love when I'm absolutely invested in someone else's growth and well-being without mm-hmm. any connection to myself. So this is a, a sort of an amplification of that. You know, I, I, I will say in closing that one of the elements of the show that I, I just really enjoy and I just think it's absolutely crucial um, to human well-being is your commitment to conversation Um, because it's only in thoughtful brave conversation that we unearth um, common humanity where we unearth shared values Mm -hmm. um, that we all want our parents health to thrive we all want our children to grow up and live in a better world than we're living in. And, you know, a lot of these dreams and values, you know, get lost in the murkiness of yeah. sociopolitical arguments, et cetera. And, uh, and, you know, some of my uh, favorite moments, and in fact, I would just, the general character of the show is based around conversation. And it, is that, was that purposeful going into it? And is that just sort of a natural quality that you have or, or something that you've you've developed over years as a journalist um you know i'd love to say that this is a technique you know that i've learned uh throughout the years but i think it's something that has always been there like with me mm-hmm. i've i've always liked to hear stories and i've always loved listening like i, I was not the cool guy in school. I was not the popular one in my family. Uh, I get. I guess my cousins would even say that I might have been the least likely to succeed, and I don't say that in a pretentious way at all. But just because I I, I liked listening more than I liked talking, and I think we live in such a polarized world right now. Uh, we hear that a lot, but it is true. Like people don't listen. You know, it's almost like people see. Uh, politics, for example, as a religion, as uh, like in Brazil, as sports, you know, once you have a team, it doesn't matter if the leader did something right or wrong or killed someone like I'm sticking to my Flamingo. Team. <laughs> yes. and there is no shifting. There is no regretting. There is no, you know, I voted for this person. Maybe I shouldn't have. No, it's just so hard headed. Yeah. And my passion in life, I think is to actually allow myself to go there. I remember when we went to Ecuador to the Waurani tribe, which is one of the most isolated indigenous communities on earth. Um, And I mean, they're known to kill a lot of people, including women and children. Like they have been responsible for, you know, what the government says are genocides. Uh, And they're like, you can't ask about this. You can't ask about that. You can't touch upon this subject. And not because I like to (laughs) break the rules, but once people trust you, once they know that you're not there, you're not out to get them, they start opening up. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't, you know, not, you know, fuel it, but if I didn't listen. 
people want to share what they think. They want you to understand how they're feeling, why they think that. They do. But I think it's all about approach. Mm. You know, like you can't show up to an interview and go to the jugular and like ask that question. You know, what about that woman that lost their mother and you killed her? There is a story like that in one of the episodes. But there is a way of basically not in a like a malicious strategy, but I'm more interested in how do you feel? Like, what is it living here today? How do you eat? Will you show me how to hunt? And when people trust you, they will open up to you. And I think that's a lesson, not just for isolated communities, but in our everyday life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, listening with the goal of understanding and yes. not listening to respond or convert. <laughs> um, yes. and, uh, and yeah, your commitment to that is on full display, um, you know, over and over there. Um, and it's really just just great work, and uh, I applaud it. I'm a I'm a new fan, uh, oh and a and a I'm pro so and, and, and a, I mean, and a proselytizer. Conversation <laughs> like this to me is such a pleasure. And part, like, I mean, you're incredible, but I'm saying like you listen and you 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 actually are digesting what your guest is saying. So. Uh, I hope it's the first of many chats. Yeah, absolutely. To be continued for sure. Where can people find Unknown Amazon, at least in the in the short term? Yes. Uh, July 13th, the first episode, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern on Vice, and then every Tuesday, a new episode. Uh, and in the fall, it's going to be bingeable in other platforms as well. But let's start with where we are right now absolutely well i think uh the rawness and uh just the visceral qualities of it um feel concomitant with with vice and the tradition of vice so uh i think it's it's a it's a fantastic home well, i'm on instagram and i'd love for your listeners if they watch the show when they watch the show i'd love to get their feedback it's uh at pedro andrade tv it will mean a lot to me absolutely Pedro, thank you so much. I so appreciate you being uh, with thank me you today. Thank you so much, and I will talk to you soon. Stay in touch. I'm Jeff Krasno, and welcome to Commune, where every week we explore the ideas, values, and practices that bring us together and help us live healthy and purpose-filled lives. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We hope you'll join us.